taking a stand. The act of publicly proclaiming the strong feelings you have towards or against something or someone. Taking a stand is physically using your hands, feet, and voice to push a dedication you have building up inside your bones. To take a stand, you go against the grain, zig when others zag, and are forced to be confident, courageous, and brave. To take a stand is daring, so the few that succeed deserve recognition. When people hear the phrase, taking a stand in American history, their minds go to people such as Martin Luther, for inspiring an equal society, Susan B. Anthony, campaigning for the women's right to vote, or Abraham Lincoln, a U.S. president using powerful messages to bring slavery to an end. But what we don't hear about is the small town people defending a big dream starting with their communities and expanding nationwide. Born in rural Mississippi in 1930, a boy named John Perkins was raised by his grandparents who were sharecroppers. John grew up in the poorest economy in Mississippi. Little did John know that he would someday establish a holistic approach to accomplish reconciliation, economic development, and education. Raised in the Deep South, John was surrounded by racism. If hunger, poverty, and disease didn't kill him, bigotry, racism, or the KKK might. Quoted from his book, Let Justice Roll Down, John writes, I lived in Mississippi. I used to ride in those segregated buses, sit in the back of the bus. That's dehumanizing. When I would go to a restaurant someplace and would have to go around back in all those dark, dirty places, that would hurt. I saw people with hardly enough to eat and knew a lot who were killed, not because they'd done anything wrong, but because they were black. In October, I traveled 400 miles to a Christian Community Development Conference on the campus of Dort College in Northwest Iowa. I was able to hear firsthand stories from John of racial challenges and reconciliation. During the conference, John told the tragic story of how his brother Clyde was fatally shot and killed by a white deputy marshal. Over the course of two days, I was able to see a glimpse of the dangers of living in rural Mississippi. John's community was not only divided by a set of railroad tracks, but racial strife and John felt the only way out was to leave his home to find true life. In 1947, John purchased a one-way train ticket to Southern California to begin his new life. Only 17 and with a third grade education, John began working his first job at 90 cents an hour. Making the same wage as the whites, John was satisfied with his pay considering it was a step up from his $20 a month pay back in Mississippi. Although living a tight income, John could see glimpses of hope that were once blocked off to him in Mississippi. Quoted from John's book, All my life I have lived with a sort of ceiling above me, a ceiling that said, You're black. You can't go no higher. No, I was used to hard work so I wasn't looking for any easy job. Just one that had a patch of blue sky up above me instead of a ceiling, a chance to climb. By the spring of 1957, John could feel he had pretty good chances in life, and that good feeling was a lot deeper than just the money. John was able to earn. John was a provider. He felt successful. John's family background had been anti-religious. After he married his wife, Vera May, John was invited to attend church with her. After hearing the gospel message, John was a changed man. John and his wife continued attending church and learned more about their new Christian faith. Before long, John felt a calling 
to take a stand by embarking on a courageous journey. Although John's life in California was near perfect, he felt an urgency to return back to the poor in Mississippi. As John said, I couldn't escape the conviction that was growing deep inside me, the conviction that I was called back to Mississippi to identify with my people there and to help them break the cycle of despair, not by encouraging them to leave, but by showing them new life right where they were. Using his experience he learned in California, John created a ministry to reach adolescents in Mendenhall, Mississippi. John said, the children don't know me personally, but I knew their world, their language, and I had their black skin. John wanted to use his position to help young people see the value in life and encourage them to succeed in it. In 1962, John created Genesis One School. He established quality education, reconciliation, and forgiveness. John wanted to heal the racial tensions that had been built, and he was going to use his school to teach it. Uh, just a talker. John Perkins is a doer. He's out there getting his hands dirty, working in these little communities and literally showing people how they can help themselves to a better life. In the spring of 2013 and 14, I had the privilege to travel to Mendenhall, Mississippi to work alongside Mendenhall Ministries. We worked to organize a week-long day camp for kids. When we arrived in Mendenhall, it was clear to see that although the physical dividing train tracks still remained, the sense of community was felt with welcoming arms. Those trips in 2013 and 14 were life-changing, and I was able to see firsthand the work that John Perkins created in his community. John has taken his model and taught community leaders all over the world. This small town boy with a big dream took a stand to restore justice, create economic opportunities, and empower youth education. Following John's example, how can you take a stand to impact your little corner of the world?